we have been playing just got out of hand. Power plants, power plays your futures yesterday. Somebody stands and cries, the children have a right. Then somebody stands and cries, how come this oversight? Then they understood there were none to speak or none that would. And the women. Here, inside my mind, a woman thinking about war. It is a winter day and I have just been out walking. Blossoms, which appeared late in January, are scattered by wind and rain over the grass, the pine trees, the houses. The sun has settled over the mountains and casts a brilliant light on the bay. Though I am 15 miles away, an image of this light settles on my retina and my eye is made warm. Last week I dreamt that I looked into a light that blinded me. A bomb had just exploded, and bitterly, over and over, I asked myself, why did I look? Why did I look? Women are not the authors of war stories. Do we think about war the same way men do? 
One cannot say all women are pacifists and all men wage war. One cannot say all women cook stews and all men fire arms. Once I was handed a gun that had been recovered from a German soldier in World War II. Protesting that I hated weapons and had never fired a gun, I proceeded to hit the center of the target with four out of six bullets. I could not help feeling proud of myself. That evening when I walked through the countryside of Normandy, I had a more cocky stride and imagined I would look charming wearing the leather jacket of a bombardier. Let us not make things too simple along the lines of certain rigorous theories. Besides, if there is such a thing as a woman's mind, this is a mind trained to be more attentive to detail. The stew a woman cooks is made up of the carrots that have become soft and only good now for cooking the leftover beef about to turn bad, the half a cup of barley still in the pantry to be fed to a particular child, mother, uncle, lover, man. Salt? What? A pinch? No, my mother cannot eat salt. All women may not cook stews, yet this habit of attention to detail persists in many of us, passed on like a whisper by a scarcely perceivable agreement that we should take it upon ourselves to somehow try to resemble our mothers, or our grandmothers. What is it about our minds that is different? We are the custodians of a world of cares, essential to survival, yet unnamed in the records men make of events. What we know to be real exists only like a shadow or the traces of an otherwise invisible phenomena in the shared consciousness of our culture. And although we may forget or try to forget what we know, this knowledge gives a certain cast to our minds. A detail will lodge in a woman's mind and shape her thinking, even when she is thinking theoretically. In the papers, I read the name of a woman in Lebanon who is afraid that her farm will be destroyed by Syrian or Israeli shells. She is Mrs. Jarush. Her name lodges itself in my mind, Mrs. Jarush. If she were to visit me, or I were to visit her, both of us would offer some drink, some food, a place to sit. And before we spoke of other things, we would ask, your children, your parents? We have been raised to be polite. We do not discuss world politics outside of a certain context, a certain ritual in which all that is important to us is somehow named, touched, evoked. Is this old-fashioned? When I asked for my freedom, I did not have it in mind that I should abandon all the habits of my gender. After all, there is something women have known for centuries, an open secret told over and over in the way we have sustained life. Men hear this secret when they are first born and as little boys, and though they may attempt to forget what they know, they must learn it again as they take their last breath. Coming and going, none of us can avoid this secret and all of it, the way we are born and come of age, all the habits of families, all the life lived inside houses, inside my house, inside Mrs. Jarusha's house and our grandmother's houses, bears upon the subject of war. One way or another, it does. I have a daughter, Mrs. Jarush. How many children do you have? Grandchildren? We do not have to tell each other that we want our children to live on to ripe ages. This is implicit in the way we put our cups down for a moment and greet the air with our hands as we speak of them. There was a coming and going. There was a long cry. Who cried over the many deaths and the many wars recorded by history? No doubt both men and women. If the men did not cry outwardly, they cried inwardly. We know this. But when we think back, isn't it a woman we imagine weeping? A woman sculpted into a posture of grief in the cemetery, and a man with medals cutting a figure of bronze courage in the park near the water where the children play with their boats, pigeons resting on his head. Perhaps women do tell war stories, only our stories are so different. Has there ever been a military history written by the ones who stayed at home? There are many books I want to write. They crowd together like too many passengers eager to fill the same train. 
someone will be left behind. But for each the journey is urgent, urgent, and cannot be postponed. There is no other train. And furthermore, we want to ride together. We cannot quite explain how, but somehow we have become a group, an entity. We will have to make do. Our idea of what is fitting and elegant will have to be altered slightly. The dining car will be inhabited now at all hours, and the aisles will be filled with passengers, mothers holding babies, whole families sitting on their suitcases. Unless I crowd all my books into this one book, I will be eighty before I am done. But that is not possible, because along the way I know I would forget. And besides, one begins to feel other urgencies as one grows older. At sixty or eighty, different issues rise up in a woman's life. There is a time for everything. Warfare. The Holocaust. Shall I pretend I am certain I will live to be eighty, or that my daughter will have what is known as an adult life? The phenomenology of family life, intimacy, these are the subjects that come together in my mind. The sexual lives of men and women, my sexual ancestry. Do I know exactly how they all fit together? No. Passengers sit on top of one another, step on each other's raincoats, spill soup on one another. The old, comfortable arrangements are in disarray. It is unseemly. And perhaps that is the point. Now, isn't it time for a woman thinking about war to think unseemly thoughts, to leap out of the old categories, to weigh apples and oranges together by the same scale, the one in which our lives hang suspended in the balance? Let us consider all things equally. No creature, no blade of grass, not an apple nor an orange, not my child nor the neighbor's child, not Mrs. Jarouche halfway round the world is secure. Some breath of the blast will reach all of us, and even now we may have taken in a particle, and even now the idea of it all is in us. There are events in our lives that we cannot understand because we keep a part of what we know away from understanding. War is one of those events. And there are other private events which mystify us as if there were no explanation for them except nature itself. That we are mystified becomes a habit passed from one generation to the next. My father suffered from the silence of his father, and I suffered from his. A certain kind of silence, that which comes from holding back the truth, is abusive in itself to a child. The soul has a natural movement toward knowledge, so that not to know can be to despair. In the paucity of explanation for a mood, a look, a gesture, the child takes on the blame and carries thus a guilt for circumstances beyond childish influence. Men the way they have been shaped from childhood and because of their pride, do not suffer well the loss of livelihood, and they will risk a great deal to keep it. In 1957, before a unit of Marines was ordered into the trenches, three miles away from the explosion of a nuclear weapon, they were told, what you are about to do is very special and for the benefit of all mankind. Your country will be proud of you. Afterwards, these men crouched down in trenches. They were told to cover their faces with their hands and wait. There was a long, slow countdown, and when it stopped, a very bright light, brighter than the sun. Though their eyelids were shut, they could see the bones in their hands. It was as if the world had turned inside out and nothing could be relied upon to be as it had been before. The sound of the explosion was shattering, and then the ground began to shake violently. Several more miles away, a woman thought she felt an earthquake. Some men were quickly buried in the earth, and all this instilled a particular terror, so that even men who had been close to death in combat were frightened and lost control. Some were weeping. The light was still blinding when a powerful wind, a wind which threw even men half buried in the earth on their backs, began to blow. 
A mushroom cloud formed over the sky, and a thick dust began to fill the air so that one could see no more than a few feet in any direction. One man who had gone through another explosion moments before this bomb went off had wanted to stand up to shout, Stop! Stop! We don't deserve to die this way. He had been told his body was in no danger from radiation, and he could not see it or taste it himself. He knew this explosion was to be more powerful than the first he had experienced, yet I believe there was something more he felt, not palpable to the senses as we know them, but there. He had been through four years of a military academy in the South. He had the ambition of becoming a Marine Corps officer, and now he was one. One of his teachers in the basic officer's training had told him that the greatest honor he could achieve would be to die on the battlefield. His body shook uncontrollably, but still he did not speak and only feared, along with his body's terror, that this shaking might be seen by the men he was commanding. There are many things that we know that we are not supposed to know. Sometimes there is a conspiracy to silence us, but at other times it may be that what we have to tell is something no one wants to know because what we say does not fit into the scheme of things as they are understood to be. A child tells a doctor she has been raped by her father. She may even have signs on her body of this rape, a tear or a fissure, but the doctor refuses to see. A young woman remembers that she was raped, but the man hearing this story tells himself he hears only her fantasy. Shall I call her Nell, the woman whose name I cannot tell? I name her after my great-aunt who was born in southern Illinois, which is almost like the South. When I imagine her father forcing himself up a hill and into the mines, I imagine his hands trembling as my own hands have trembled when I am overtired. And I can imagine Nell trembling, too, after her father had forced himself upon her, trembling and not knowing where to take this trembling. The men who emerged from the trenches were deeply impressed by the devastation they saw. Tanks were melted. Heavy equipment had become cinders. There was a kind of confusion. No one seemed to know quite what to do. Men appeared in clothing designed to protect them from radiation, clothing the Marines did not wear. Some men were directed away from the areas which had been called contaminated. On a mountain range several miles north, yucca trees were burning. The men could not find equipment they had been ordered to operate, but still they formed columns of twos and marched in time over this landscape. I can imagine these men standing at attention the morning after this explosion. They have on clean, pressed uniforms. They are washed and shaven. It is before breakfast and they are hungry. Each man is relieved to pass inspection as he waits for his next orders. Do they hope against hope that it will not happen again? When I ask this, I think right away of Nell's mother. When her first daughter was raped, two others were already born. I try to become her and immediately I have a feeling for the event. I find myself gripping the edge of my desk as if the ground were shaking violently. And as the violence of my imagination stops, there is a kind of numbness and a kind of confusion. Things have somehow got to go on, I say to myself, and over time I begin to forget why I do not let my oldest daughter come home until I am home. That's just how things are, I say to myself. Mercifully, this violent event recedes from my consciousness, almost like a nightmare whose images give me only a vague feeling of discomfort in the daytime. But nightmares recur. There are other daughters. Nowhere is there a record of all that has happened in human history except in living consciousness. And does the truth each of us knows die along with us unless we speak it? This we cannot know. Only we can know that the consequences of every act continue and themselves cause consequences until a later generation will accept the circumstances created of these acts as inevitable. Unless instead this generation tries to unravel the mystery and if they penetrate the secret whose scent persists in all eventualities, will they say finally, 
This death, this wound, this suffering was not necessary. The bridge between the Bronx and Manhattan crosses a small body of water which runs between the Hudson and the East River and is called Spiten Dival, Dutch for the Devil's Tail.
computer chip malfunctions, a microscopic switch slips, you cut an apple into quarters. East of the Urals, a technician sweats into gray fatigues. In Nevada, a video screen registers activity. The president carries a briefcase called the football. His men sit at a small table or cluster in easy chairs watching a screen tick with revelation. You adjust your blinds. I flip a cellar switch. A terrorist monitors the football. A red light on a red telephone flashes. The technician cues his superior. Afternoon in the desert. Dead of night in the Urals. Rockets surge from concrete silos like lipsticks sprung from gargantuan tubes. I have seen bridges dynamited in 3D color, mushroom clouds engorge and shrivel in 4-4 time, faces of children etched with acid to rippling wound on screens the size of footballs. So have you. In a cellar where the ceiling is low, I bump my head, shatter the only source of light. This cellar was not built airtight, but I keep firewood here, my water pump, boiler. <laughs> Driving across the bridge which connects the Bronx to Manhattan. River blue below, sun rippling its surprising expanse, and always entering New York by this route. I love life. Planes. No. Missiles. Or must we call them warheads? How fast. Morning. You stand at your kitchen telephone, then drive down the hill. Or twilight, you bend at a keyboard, moving as you play. Ten minutes from that place to this. Frozen expression on the face of the drunk who wipes my windshield on the Bowery. I want your hand. Warheads. You slip an apple, quarter by quarter, into your mouth. We never sat facing each other. What might we make of this love? Anyone who calls a broken heart a metaphor hasn't seen the crack in this sunset. Fire clouds parting, cylindrical beasts roaring toward us. Do they land? Or do objects tumble, blazing, each from an open hatch? Sudden light so bright it brings utter darkness. Sound so loud it could be silence. I am blind, and I step from my car. My hair is on fire. It could be an earring or an orange pinwheel. My hand is burning. My hair stinks when it burns. Below this bridge at the tip of the city is a white sand beach. Did you know that? Tell me. Why don't you reach for my hand? We are all blind. All feel heat which mounts so fast, I can't tell if I sweat or shiver. has burned back to my scalp, and now my skin is burning off my brain. Flesh melts down my leg like syrup. We won't walk to the river. There's no mirror, and my head is too hot to touch. The birds are burning. 
They say cities will melt like fat. That one has fewer bones. Breathe. He was just collecting our quarters. We were dancing. They told me this would happen. Hot oceans, flat darkness. I stay awake to speak this. My fingers have burned to bone, and so have yours. I never wanted a child, but I saved everything important so those who came after could learn. It has not been explained to us that a computer chip has the shape of a wafer but is invisible to the naked eye, or that a switch has less thickness than a capillary, or that the cloud of fire is as fierce and huge as Niagara Falls. You have chosen this distance. We will not hear the terrible news together. When they tell us we have the power to stop this, we speak only of our powerlessness to stop a blizzard in April. There is nothing more I could have said to you. You cross the Golden Gate. Planes? No. Missiles. How fast? None of the children believe they will be grandparents. Those behind bars will burn behind bars, and I think of flowers. Why doesn't this scare me as much as losing love again or not having enough money? I will break a bone, or my bones will burn. I can't see what's happening in Nevada. I keep giving them money. You are not here. My breath is burning. We must go downstairs, take hands with the others, speak something. When they said, put your head to the wall, fold your arms behind your neck, I was not afraid. Even when I saw the movies, I wasn't afraid. But I am afraid of burning, of burning and breaking. When they say we will burn, I feel knives. When they say buildings will fly apart, that I will be crushed by a concrete buttress or a steel beam, I hear the weeping of everyone into whose eyes I have been afraid to look. If men carried knives in airplanes, this is how it would be. Airplanes are silver. They fly across the sky, which is blue. One day, a hatch falls open. Knives fly down like rain, and we are all cut and all bleed. What if, day after day, knives fell from the sky? I would go into my cellar hope my roof would repel knives. Failure of love has brought us to this. You iron. It could be thunder. They keep listening to music. Let me tell you, the difference is the whole city is an oven which won't go out, and if it could, there would be no one to put it out. Let me tell you, you will never see morning again or early spring. Look, fire sheets down the river like wind before a hurricane. Listen, it rushes through city streets like falls down a mountain. No one will read what you write. No one will eat what you put on the table. It is not thunder. There is no time to make amends. You will not know her as you wished, 
and you will never see your face in the faces of your nieces and nephews. Peel the apple with a knife. Eat the apple without peeling it. Choose beautiful paper to draw her head, or draw it on a napkin after dinner. Eat eggs and sausage and oranges for breakfast, or don't eat. Drink tea or drink coffee. Call your father to wish him happy birthday. Use a band-aid when you scratch your hand on rose thorn, or bleed freely into your grandmother's linen. Plant potatoes as you planned. Let the candles burn down to stumps, or replace them with new ones. I have wanted to be free to feel, to welcome you with flowers, see your smile time after time. When the apple limb fell, too heavy with rain and fruit, I painted its wound with tar. This year I will fertilize so the tomatoes have no hardship. I am not afraid to begin to love or to keep loving. Even in this fire, it is not fear I feel, but heartbreak. Because he is afraid and powerful, he lives encircled by water. We hold her as she dies, turn the chairs to face each other. We breathe with her as her child is born, let him cry in the dark as he mourns her death. When we don't have what we need, we use what is nearest. One day he swims the moat to explore the place which confuses him. There is food when he reaches the lit house and stars hang from the towering branches of ancient trees. We must learn to rest when we are tired. Every morning the sun rises, every spring green returns to the cold climates. Bathe with her, stand with her in her house smiling as she shows you the new wood. If their anger frightens you, try to understand their grief. If you can't understand what they say, watch how they move. It's thunder. She is young, tell her the truth. He is near 90. Help him cross the street. It's thunder. Reach for my hand. I will let you go. It's raining. If you visit, we will walk down through the fields and I will show you the river.